the, the 55 thesis, uh, your website is a great segue coming, going from the machine learning approach into actionable ways to uh, extend human lifespan now, right? But then mm. once, once the machine learning uh, approach has characterized the omics of, uh, you know, uh, extreme longevity, at least in Drosophila, mm -hmm. then the challenge mm -hmm. is going to be, uh, and even if, even if slash when that's done in humans within the next few years, the challenge is going to be uh, how do you positively impact that, impact that with the goal of getting significant increases in lifespan. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. in the reductionist science era that we live in, most studies are going to be one supplement at a time. And if you propose multi-ingredient formulations, probably it'll get mm -hmm. laughed at or rejected in review. So there, mm -hmm. what do you think about the technical hurdles in terms of going from characterizing the phenotype, of com comprehensive characterization of the phenotype of aging into now using the similar machine learning approach to uh, get dramatic increases in, in uh, health and lifespan? Okay, so there's an intermediate step that I think is available this decade. Um, <clears throat> you can use all the same tools um, in order to properly characterize what supplements or pharmaceuticals you're doing. And as you know full well, the only real difference between a supplement and a pharmaceutical is its legal status, right? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, basically, any given supplement or pharmaceutical is going to have effects that are as complicated as the effects of experimental evolution. Um, and, and evidence to, to that effect has been accumulating over the last 20 years since we got good genomic and insane transcriptomic tools. Um, <clears throat> there is no simplicity to be found, even if you are doing one substance in interventions. Um, all through the 20th century, you know, biology was the science of the math phobic, except for my fields, which are evolutionary and quantitative genetics, which is where those of us who like math, uh, you know, that, that's how we do our biology, we do it with math, um, serious math, not trivial math. Um, well, it turns out that in the 20th century, this kind of uh, kindergarten for biology, where biologists got away with doing uh, the simplest experiments that could give you interpretable results, which are great, you know, for genetic diseases, um, where you do have one or a few major pathways that are colossally screwed up. But as soon as you step away from that to most people's chronic aging associated disorders, thus aging itself, you're dealing with a whole world of painful complexity, which only people with my background really enjoy. Um, unfortunately, genomics arrived uh, at the end of the 20th century, start of the 21st century, and qualitatively blew up the game for the reductionists who wanted to study anything more complicated than genetic diseases or you know, the consequences of simple packaging cell viruses. Um, <clears throat> so even though the reductionists are loath to admit it, and even though they dominate NIH in large swathes of NSF, they're dead. They're just scientifically and technologically dead in the water. They're floating face down, you know, like William Holden at the start of Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> uh, it's over for them. And, you know, like the uh, heliocentric, um, Tol Ptolemaic astronomers um, in the 17th century, the century of Galileo and Newton, they are not accepting their obsolescence with any great grace, magnanimity, or care for the welfare of their fellow human. They're fighting tooth and nail against the destruction of reductionism. But reductionism is being destroyed with every good genomic, transcriptomic, or metabolomic publication, because they all show complexity. And the beauty of it is that people like myself, Alex Shavarenko, a whole bunch of other people, 
are just, you know, we're not hanging around the funeral of the reductionist, we're just moving on. And we're using machine learning tools to try to parse that complexity and find ways forward. Um, and and that, that's where the action is going to be. Um, so even with the machine learning based approach, and I'm 100% on board, I've been thinking about that for the longest time too. So even with a machine learning based approach, let's say you've got a big study of thousands of hundreds of thousands of more people and you mm -hmm. use machine learning AI based approach to come up mm -hmm. with uh, a set of parameters that could potentially extend health and lifespan in that cohort. At the end of the day though, for the average person, they still would have to use the machine learning based approach using some computational tools to predict if that, if this, you know, what worked in that big study would work for them based on their genetics, their environment, et cetera. So, so now there are two layers involved. It's machine learning at the big, you know, the macros, the macro, and then down to mm -hmm. the individual, because if the individual is just gonna, hey, it worked in that study, that's what it, they came up with, and they're mm -hmm. just gonna take it based on faith, it could do more harm than good, right? So. Okay, okay, so uh, I have two, I think, important but straightforward things to say about that. The first thing is people do this kind of machine learning interaction every day. When you use Google search, you are using a very carefully constructed set of machine learning tools that deal with vast amounts of complexity in, in less than a second in order to address the individual concerns of individual people, okay? So people, whether they realize it or not, are interfacing with gigantic databases and very powerful machine learning tools. When you, you know, looking to buy an item on Amazon, you're doing the same stuff, okay? So whether people look under the hood or not, your lives are totally entangled with machine learning tools. So all we're doing is, is extending them into the realm of biology, even though the vast majority of professional biologists who got their PhDs before 2000 hate it. I mean, they're not neutral about it. They hate it because it's just not how they were trained in how biology should be done. Because, you know, frankly, they were never evolutionary geneticists or quantitative genetists to begin with. Whereas a lot of the tools that um, genomicists use are back-end uh, quantitative genetics tools. So the GWAS is a kind of quantitative genetics type of analytic. So the first thing is, you know, the future is of technologies, including biological technologies, will be dominated by machine learning. That's just a fact. And people who can't accept it, can't really be that effective in the 21st century. <clears throat> the second thing I would say is, I'm not really fond of the idea of people sitting at home with their laptop, Googling a supplement and saying, well, gee, how much of this random supplement that somebody published in Japan based on a study of uh, using the supplement on 12 inbred mice uh, compared to, you know, eight inbred mice, 12 on the supplement, eight not on the supplement, and the 12 on the supplement lived, you know, three months longer. I'm not fond of that kind of uh, biomedical intervention. I have any number of friends and acquaintances who do that routinely. Um, a number of them have died because uh, I've known these people for more than 30 years. Um, I have never seen any really obvious substantial benefits accruing to them. What the, the, I was saying was the big, the big, uh, you know, even though machine learning is definitely going to identify uh, supplements, you know, that can extend life lifespan in big cohorts. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And I get the mm -hmm. idea that machine learning is ubiquitous in our lives. It's everywhere now. But mm -hmm. if I want to, if I want to, you know, if I have my own blood test data and I want to use a machine learning approach to identify the best panel of supplements mm -hmm. that will 
extend my health and vigor and all those things. It doesn't exist yet. I don't know when it will exist. I can only hope that it will exist sometime in the, in the near future, but. Okay. Okay. So I have a confession to make. So on the order of 10 years ago, I <clears throat> proposed to the company that I then work for, Gymnasium, that they create such, such an online interface for people exactly like you to use. Um, and I no longer think that that's a good idea. Hmm. Why? Um, so, so 10 years ago, I was literally trying to create utopia from my plus garden. <laughs> you know, because you're one of the few people, you're sort of the dream client for that website uh, because of your experience and your dedication to the use of data. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I now know a lot more than I knew then. And uh, to be fairly candid with you, I think it takes the resources of a pharma company to do a good job of going from omic data to um, recommendations for supplement use or pharmaceutical use for that matter. I think the use of pharmaceuticals for aging associated diseases right now is pretty much barbaric. Um, the lack of appropriate use of relatively obtainable information about the genomes and transcriptomes of patients uh, is a travesty. I think that that is <clears throat> one of the most important growth areas of medicine. If, if I may be very like, uh, if I may view the biomedical establishment from an altitude like the orbit of the moon, um, you have basic omic research, which of course is going to depend more and more on machine learning because it's too damn complicated to make progress in the way. You can't find a result for one site in a genome or one transcript in a transcript term and invent a verbal story and go from there to a pharmaceutical. It's ridiculous. But machine learning can take you through the omic layers and guide you. <clears throat> and that's the work of omicists aided by machine learning people. And of course, that's a big, you know, activity right now in the world. More and more companies are doing exactly what I just described. <clears throat> you don't go from those companies to individuals. You, in my opinion, you go from those companies to big pharma or moderate sized pharma. And then you go from them to, you know, you don't even go to individual physicians, you go to major healthcare providers like the NHS, Kaiser Permanente, and you have their biomedical scientists interacting with the pharma companies, interacting with the big omic databases and AI servers to knit a very big, challenging arc of technologies together. That's how I now think 10 years later, because I have the benefit of 10 additional years of <clears throat> very powerful omic and machine learning research with my colleagues. So that, that whole umbrella uh, you know, of, of collaboration it's going to take time. That's not something that can develop, you know, quickly. And not just that, it's, um, you know, once with data, there becomes interpretation of the data. And even with machine learning, you know, you're going to have an interpretation of your output, right? So even there, you know, there mm -hmm. may be three or four different roads that lead to the same health, health or lifespan extension. And then it becomes, 
I hear what you're saying in terms of the, you know, the different companies, you know, uh, giving you the ability to use the machine learning, the individual, the ability to use the machine learning approach. But uh, <laughs> not, not to sound cynical, but when you look at the, at least the American healthcare system and how literally, you know, F that is, uh, I can imagine <laughs> now you're going to have a, a group of companies who won't let me do my own analysis, but I have to follow what their analysis is and hope that their methods, which may or may not be published, uh, are going to actually lead me on the right path. So separately, uh, separately from that, uh, in terms of the, uh, just along the actually, way, I'll, I'll just comment, Mike, sure. that I totally accept your concerns. Yeah. Like I, but I'm a, like you said, I'm a different breed. You know, I want to be able to mm -hmm. run the analyses myself, do the interpretation myself, mm -hmm. so that I can actually mm -hmm. then make, you know, uh, this reasonable decision or not, right? A as opposed to leaving it in the hands of, well, mm -hmm. you know, we know better than you, you know, and I, I don't know. So for many people, maybe that's the case. They'll they'll appreciate that, but I'm in a different boat. Okay. Okay. okay let, let me just stop you there. Yep. All right. Um. So one of the reasons why I dropped the idea that I had 10 years ago, which was, you know, Google for my Lost Garden and people not as good as you, but aspiring to be as good as you, um, was I came up with a, a different short-term bridge, which is uh, the age and ancestry appropriate tuning of diet and lifestyle 